this is just an amazing uh, uh, treat for us to have Dick Edward with us. And um, and this, I, I'm, I, can't, uh, I can't say this for sure, but I'm guessing he's been looking forward to just a, 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 a free forum with students far more than he's looking forward to the interview that I'm going to do with him uh, this evening. Because he, he really sees himself as a, uh, as a professor, as a, as a teacher. And, and so this is, uh, there are really, um, there's not a lot of structure to the, how this hour is going to go. What I would love to see is, uh, he's, he's got some things that uh, he'd like to show us, uh, some of the things that he's done uh, in, in some of his uh, sports writing over the years. And uh, I think more, though, what would be of interest to Dick would be, what do you want to talk about? And what are some of the things that uh, that, are, that would be of interest to you? And um, and he's uh, he's just ready to uh, ready to engage. There are very few people who are in the Hall of Fame of both the uh, of of three different sports for professional basketball, football, and baseball. There's only one other person, to my knowledge, I think it's Kurt out, who is in all three halls of fame. Besides, uh, besides Dick Enberg, uh, this guy has seen it all, and uh, and I think it's just uh, awesome that he's here. As a way to welcome you here, Dick, I just wanted to uh, bestow one of our highest honors, <laughs> uh, which is a, uh, a hooded sweatshirt from uh, from your new favorite university, the uh, LNU. So this is for you. Disappointment, uh, crowd reaction, family, whatever, and those will all be. You know, if I put these three pieces together and maybe these four and a couple over here and, and some appropriate music underneath, I can write to that. So I, I do it somewhat backwards to what happens in television. Normally, someone uh, who produces a piece will either write it or ask you to write it, uh, and then you read it. 
Well, to me, that's backwards. So that way, I, I'm reading someone else's love for that that piece. I, it, when I when I write, I write to the video, and they go get. Here's my piece. You go find that video, and I will have marked. Yeah, you know, look at the second set, the third game, fourth point, or uh, checked uh, at uh, 2:41 in the afternoon. Uh, there was a terrific shot at the Olympic Stadium of this young child. Uh, pretending he was a long jumper or whatever, and then you put piece these things together. At the Olympics, the real challenge of the Olympics is you, it's impossible to get your arms around it. It's tough to embrace the Olympic Games. I mean, every sport is a, a world event in itself. So now how do you, and when NBC said, okay, Enberg, why don't you write a Enberg moment, a little essay every day uh, on something that you felt was important? Well, I didn't pre-write these. I go to uh, the Olympic side at 7 in the morning. I had four or five people, uh, college people, much like you folks who were interested in the business. Uh, they, they would sit in front of a TV set, and I said, anytime you see something that's televised, you say, wow, was that ever special? You mark it, let me know, let me see it. That may be something then that I can write about. And so some days you would get uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and there still wasn't a piece, and at 8.30, the Enberg moment's going to come on national television. But it always worked out. There, you know, there are so many incredible stories. This is just a quick idea, and then I'll have a, we'll go to your Q&A. I, I was thinking that the, it's interesting that the, the world's fastest human, the 100 meters in the Olympics, carries so many headlines, and yet, it's, how do we appreciate it? How do, how do we really have time to appreciate it? Because it all happens in 10 seconds. And I've got a four-minute piece here, or a three-minute piece. How can I slow down the fastest man in the world and help people to appreciate what goes physically into winning a sprint? And then I thought, well, then how do I cover myself? We had some wonderful photography of it. And I thought, there are many times that words won't suffice for this piece, so why don't I... Uh, find some music by somebody that had a fairly good reputation for writing classical music. So this was the result of how do you help the audience to appreciate the 100 meter dash by slowing it all down extremely to super slow mo. You want to try that? Olympic. What you've just seen consumed about 10 seconds, about the same time needed to meddle in the 100 meters. The blur of performance by the world's fastest humans is so very quick that it's difficult for the naked eye to appreciate fully the athlete's prowess. So, we've taken the fastest, shortest contest in the Olympic Games, lengthened and slowed it in order to showcase the complete talent of those who compete. The result, a human symphony, if you will, in four movements, beginning with the prelude for preparation, the crescendo for start, the race itself, and the finale, all with the help of Ludwig von Beethoven. Thank you. 
suspenders, build their upper body. If you see this, you realize how important the arms and shoulders are. I hate to think, but if I could run that so, fast, anyway, they each fan keeps. You know, if someone gives you an assignment to, uh, you've got a 10 second race and you've got to do a three minute piece, then you've got to be creative and imaginative. And that wasn't so much uh, the writing, but the germ of an idea that uh, with proper uh, and brilliant photography <laughs> makes it a nice piece. And I, you know, young people uh, who are interested in our business, they ask me, well, what should I do? I want your job someday. I want to be a a sports writer or a sports broadcaster. And the one piece of advice I always give them is take every writing class that you can, every writing opportunity that's available, take it, get better at it. If you listen carefully to the best, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from the sports caster, not the sports writer point of view, the best sports casters, all of them are good writers. Now, Al Michaels is a terrific writer. Keith Jackson was retired. Terrific writer. So, uh, Use those opportunities to build your writing skills. You got in a game, it's really like four acts in a play. You know, in the first act, you have to develop the characters in that play, help your audience to care about them. And in the second act, the, the the drama unfolds, and you have to build to that. And finally, you get to a fourth act, and you tie everything together. And this is why the butler uh, was the criminal in this whole thing, or this is why. Uh, this individual became the star of the game. Even though you may not have featured them at the beginning, you tied into why didn't the person you thought was going to be the star in this game become one at the end, and you turn that all around. So th think as writers. Uh, good broadcasters, uh, much less good sports writers, have to think as writers do. Okay, your questions. Hey, can I ask you, you yeah. you, you've got uh, some folks from the debate team in here, and one of my favorite lines from your book, Oh My, which, by the way, is uh, for sale out, on the, uh, out in the, the hallway. But you've got this line, I think I've got it memorized. Since I wasn't much of an athlete, I decided to join the debate team. Is, is, is that what I meant? <laughs> well, kind of, you know, I thought I was a good athlete, but my... Uh, Friends in high school and college at Edinburgh, you only talked a good game. So it worked <laughs> out. It worked out. It didn't work out. But, but the debate has had to have contributed to what you do. Today. Absolutely. I think it was the most single most important uh, educational experience in my eight years of uh, higher education. I thought in high school, typing was to be able to learn how to type got me through a lot of yeah. barbed wire once I got to the college university basis. But, in my four years undergraduate, actually four and a half, and four years of learning my master's and doctor, debate, one season of debate, even though I wasn't very good, taught me life lessons. <laughs> to be able on, in one week, to be able to argue intelligently, prepare uh, your, uh, your basis for argumentation, and try to convince people that uh, you have the proper facts and, and, and proper approach to an issue. And then the next week, have to argue the other side. How terrific is that? Well, you learn a lesson that I'm afraid a lot of my adult friends uh, never have uh, been able to assimilate, and that is that there are two sides to every issue. And it teaches you to be patient to the other side, respect the other side, and, and build your own case if you're wanting to really convince them that you have a, a better beat on, on the issue than they. So yes, uh, debate was, uh, for those of you who are debating, um, and you know what? I, was, I wasn't really good. I was like the B uh, on the B team. We won a few points, but uh, we were never the stars. Uh, but because I uh, was cut from the JV football and baseball teams, I did go to the debate books and said, oh, this is competitive. Let's, yeah. let's, uh, let's go to work on that. So, yes, uh, debate uh, still lives with me. And, sure. and it's here where we get into the uh, presidential debates now, and it's uh, if nothing else, it's kind of amusing uh, as to how they argue. Yes. Yeah, Dick, tell us about you know when you first started uh, broadcasting and uh, 
you, uh, you know, you, you probably came in with no experience at all, but uh, then all of a sudden you improved. And what kinds of things happened that caused you to improve and become better at what you did? Well, actually, the, uh, I, I was, uh, I had to drop out after my sophomore year at Central Michigan. I, I intended to be a coach, and in those days, if you majored in PE, you had to minor in health education, and that's what you did. You coached the, the teams, and you, you taught health. Uh, and I was fairly good throughout my high school years in math, so I took a, another a minor in mathematics, but not speech. Um, and uh, after uh, working at a Detroit factory for uh, one semester to earn money and learning what life really was all about and knowing that I couldn't wait to hustle back to the university, I knew uh, then how fortunate I was. Uh, I needed a, a way to make uh, a few more uh, uh, paychecks, a few more coins. I was getting 60 cents an hour busing trays in the dormitory. The, the economy has changed. Uh, uh, my fraternity brother was sweeping floors at the only radio station in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, where the campus is located, dollar an hour. And he was graduating. I said, can you put in a good word for me? Because one summer I worked at a Chrysler plant in Detroit and sweeping floors. So I knew how to handle the, you know, the working end of a broom. So I go in and I apply for the job. And uh, he says, Henry, you've got a decent voice. Um, come here. He, he took me to a little booth, put me in this booth, gave me a five-minute news summary and a couple of commercials. He said, I'm going to turn on the tape and I want you to read it. <laughs> read. I, said, I said, well, do I get a chance to look it over first? And he said, Nah, we want to see what you do just reading it cold. Well, I didn't go in there. I'd never been in a radio station in my life to, uh, to uh, read copy. So I did. Three weeks later, I get a call from the station. He said, uh, come on in. I go in. He says, you got the job. I said, where's the broom closet? He said, no, you're our new weekend disc jockey. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that uh, raised some eyebrows. And I said, well, how much does that pay? A dollar an hour. <laughs> so they weren't looking for any quality. So that's how it all started. <laughs> As a 21-year-old, 20 to becoming 21-year-old junior in college, here was an opportunity. Uh, I started as a disc jockey, and they knew when Enbrick was uh, the weekend disc jockey because every record started. <laughs> and, uh, there's a real artist starting a record uh, without it wowing. But, uh, it took me a while. To learn that. And then three weeks later, the uh, sports director. You talk about fate, the intersections of life, and just being lucky. The sports director left the station. They knew of my interest in sports. They said, "You want to try that?" I said, "Absolutely." And my junior and senior year, I was writing a daily sports cast, airing it at 545, going to college and high school football and basketball games, Little League during the summer. And so an education within uh, earning my degree that uh, certainly paid the big dividends later. But I had no intention of, of uh, being someone that might be standing in front of this group today. So it's a lot of good faith. Then when I went to Indiana for my graduate work, there was an audition for their new sportscaster in the Indiana Sports Network, and I won that. So I did their games in the Big Ten for four years. And then when I came out to teach and coach at Cal State Northridge, I thought, you know, we were, I think the most I made was a doctorate and uh, four years' experience. I think where they were paying 4200 a year at that time. So I, want, I needed a summer job, and so I shopped myself all around the Los Angeles market. And eventually, uh, uh, people got to know me, and Gene Autry at Channel 5, uh, his station, radio and TV station, they hired me, and I made the big jump from education to the big dollars of TV, it went up to 18000 a year. Wow. Yeah. Went from 4000 to 18000 4200 to 18000 Wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> my was And so was I, because this has been 60 years of, yeah, it's not, never been work. The preparation is part of the fun of the job trying to get those little nuggets perhaps that no one else has to make uh, your broadcast as interesting as it can be, even when the game isn't good. You know, many of the games are go south, they're lopsided, they're not very interesting. Then it's your job to entertain the audience. And uh, that's why, along with taking writing classes, don't limit yourself to anything. You know, I, I just know enough about classical music, and I really have learned a lot of classical music, that I, I could foresee that piece. Yeah. yeah, if I said, hey, I'm only in sports, you guys, the classical music people, or you are uh, majors, you go over there, well then, you know, there's all uh, kinds of, especially in baseball, to draw 
your information about, hey, maybe I went to the old bowl the night before and I could talk about the play of the game goes on. Or, or there, there was a, a concert that we attended. Or looking through uh, the uh, daily newspaper, not just in the sports section, but look, maybe there's something else hidden in there that might be interesting. Oh, there's a San Diego woman that just celebrated her 110th birthday. Well, you know, Mark Grant and I might have a little fun with that. You know? We add up our two ages and we, we tie you know, or something you know, to have fun with, with uh, that preparation. Question? Okay. Maybe I can ask you, uh, what's the worst criticism you ever received in your career? And how did you rise about that? Worst uh, cri criticism that I received? Yeah, they uh, you tend to repress those. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> really nasty. <massive. laughs> and you know, I, they're, they're, there's never really been that nasty one, but I think any of us, when you read a, a television sports <laughs> critic, uh, his column or her column, and they take you apart for something they don't like about your work, or, and oftentimes it's a legitimate criticism. And criticisms are terrific. That's how you become better. You know, it doesn't always feel good to have it in, in public like that, where you're you know, having darts thrown at you. The, the, where I'm disturbed is that many of the so-called critics are not critics, they're cynics, and that takes it to a different level. And if somebody just wants to hurt you by using their uh, platform uh, to rip you apart, then that's, and, and unfortunately with social media, that there are thousands of people who are uh, hidden in their mother's basement and they're 40 years old, they can only uh, find, something, <laughs> find something wrong with everything. So I, I refuse to even read that. I don't think that improves me at all. Criticism. But healthy criticism is a good thing. Uh, I've made my mistakes, and people always want to know well, what's the worst thing that, you know, you've ever done. And there have been a few of those. Um, early on at um, Channel 5, uh, I didn't do the Angels play-by-play. Uh, -play. I did the pre- and post-game show, and I had little help. And we, had, we created a magnetic board that had enough room to put every major league team on it. And then magnetic numbers so that you know, when I wrapped up the game, okay, let's go to the scoreboard, and here the Kansas City four and the White Sox three, and all the scores were there. But I had to put those up. So I would create the show, get here are the tapes we're going to use, we'll use that double play, we'll take the winning home run, we'll do the rest. And then I got to run out with all the scores. So I'm going to put it, put, what was the score of that Detroit game? And now I'm getting 10, 9, 8, and I'm hurrying and dropping and finally <laughs> get the last number and then, oh, wherever it was, and what a game today. Yeah? And then I go into my pitch. I'm sitting down at the time. I go into my pitch, and uh, there was no uh, interrupt from the producer at that time. It was just the, me and the cameraman and the foreman. And, but I can just sense something isn't quite right. And I'm going on, and we're going to have quite a show today. And the, the uh, Angels picking up a win, the ninth inning rally, terrific. And finally, the, the cameraman's going. And uh, in my haste to get on the air, I was sitting on my lavalier mic. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you can imagine the uh, mail I received never sounded better. And, uh, <laughs> so if anyone claims that they've uh, invented the rectal microphone, no, <laughs> that belongs to <laughs> Actually, one of the criticisms, yeah. your point, but, uh, <coughs> one of the criticisms that you've had recently is that you're not a big enough uh, cheerleader for the Padres, right? That that when it's a when somebody else does something, you know, it's a home run against the Padres, you celebrate that. And so well, some of the criticism has been, come on, you're only supposed to. Yep, that's that's true. Right. That, yeah, know. we're we're fairly provincial here in San Diego. We go through for our own teams, and if you say something complimentary about the opposition, there are, there's a certain part of the fan base that thinks you're rooting for them, that you don't care about us. Whose side are you on? Well, we're on the side of pre presenting a good Padre telecast. My dad taught me, you know, it's interesting going back in the days where black and white days where men wore suit and tie and doors to the baseball games. And whenever an opposing player made a great play, you didn't stand up and cheer the way you would cheer your own team, the Detroit Tigers. But when that uh, player came to the dugout, the fans would give him a hand and applaud. He made a great baseball play. We're really denying ourselves a lot if we can't enjoy the beauty of sport from all sides. We can cheer heartily for our side, but enjoy it all. To turn uh, the shades on, uh, 
uh, close the doors or windows on somebody else just because they're wearing a different uniform to me is nonsense. But uh, I am employed by a San Diego uh, team, and they've said, you know, just you know, tone it down a little bit when the other uh, when the other team has a great play. So my call is uh, for home run is touch them all. It came from when I was coaching baseball. We'd be behind and have a couple runners on, and we'd yell to the next day, hey, touch them all. And we'd hit a three-run home. And so I've used touch them all. And so when I my first uh, couple of months with the Padres, uh, seven years ago, uh, the opposing player hit a home run. And I said, and so, uh, let's say, Matt Kemp with the Dodgers. Kemp touches them all. And next day I got a call come in and said, you know, uh, we're getting some complaints from our fans that you're rooting too hard for the other team. And uh, I said, how's that? And they explained. I said, well, I, got, I have to maintain my journalistic integrity here. Uh, what do you want me to do? You know, to go silent when the other team uh, does something? Uh, well, and he said, well, I'll tell you what, what if you uh, just don't use your home run call? Use touch them all for when the Padres hit a home run, but if the other guys hit a home run, just say, Fly ball deep to left, it's out of here, or something else. Yeah, I said, I can, I can deal with that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I But it is, the training as a network announcer was to play right down the middle. And the, the most uh, wonderful commendation that you could receive when you came back from a big game and you looked through your mail was there were these letters that said, man, you really were for the Denver Broncos. And these letters that said, you're really for the New England Patriots. And I could just crisscross and mail that letter to that side and these letters to that side. That was my answer. I mean, you're trying to, to play it right down the middle. So. Yes? As I hear you talk, you know, obviously what stands out is the clarity of your words, uh, the, the sharpness of your logic, but also just the vibrancy of your voice. And I'm wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about training your voice, protecting your voice, and maybe you've had experiences where had to go on where you really don't have a voice and what that was like. Well, the, the DNA helps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People say, hey, you've got a great voice. I said, yeah, mother and father gave you that. <laughs> now, you, can, you can develop that. And when, when I listen to some of my tapes back in the college days, I'm really up here. I knew a lot of games up here. <laughs> I learned that there's no need to have to stay up there. I had nowhere else to go. Why don't you come down here and then work your way up the ladder? So, there, you know, that's part of the educational process. If you go back to the early days of Bob Costas, his voice was very high. It's a matter, I think, of using your voice as singers do. I've, I've taken some opera lessons which were fantastic. I didn't think I could hit the high notes because I have a baritone voice. And uh, this, this opera singer teacher has me lying down on the floor going and uh, all these other exercises and, and, and had to sing Part of the whole deal was at the end of the lessons, all of us had to uh, a recital, and you had to sing a song. And I was able to get some notes I never thought I could. So my my uh, vocalizing in the shower has never been better. <laughs> so you know, you, uh, I'll, I'll tell you an incident, and I, I wish I knew this, this gentleman's name. He, he worked at a radio station in Saginaw, Michigan, and. I was trying to go from Mount Pleasant, Michigan at a dollar an hour to the big market over in Saginaw where they paid two dollars an hour. And so I went in for an audition and he said, yeah, you've got a lot of energy, uh, but um, I mean, you have no place to go with your voice. He said, let me play it back. So he plays it back. And, I, and I'm just doing a sports show. And today, the Detroit Red Wings beat the Montreal Canadiens. And I'm up here. He said, go back in there and try to be as low as you can. Use your voice to the lowest level you can and read the same material. So I did that. Came back and came <coughs> back to back. And what a gift that was. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, I've never gone, as most of you are taking journalism or broadcasting classes. I didn't take any of those at all. I, I, I had lived my way to, uh, to the success. But here was a great... Uh, a tip, and I think you can, you know, uh, I won't mention the names, but I worked with some people here, and I suggested, you know, you know, go tape, even if you're taping something in your own home, listen to yourself, and push yourself, push yourself to being really excited, and push yourself to be really like this, now and give it that golfing you know, here's the eight foot flat voice, uh, and, and see how it sounds, and sometimes you'll feel as you do it, it's so unnatural. That's not how I would be. But then when you listen to yourself, that's, that's really the attitude you should have. And, uh, and, and in many ways, my son is trying to become a, a 
broadcaster now, and so I've been coaching him up. And, and uh, part of that is to push yourself to those extremes and see what you have. We're actors. Sportscasters do a lot of acting, and that's how you use your voice, whether it be an excitement, drama. Now, okay, here we come. Bottom of the eighth inning, still no hits on the board. This could be a no-hitter. And to the point where that is a no hitter. Oh my! So uh, I, I think you don't need to have an audience to practice those things. You can work on your voice and develop it. And uh, and while you're there, uh, don't be afraid to have fun with your voice and have fun with your job because I think the audience loves it when you have fun with each other. When you get a, a good laugh is generated in the broadcast booth and. <laughs> People at home say, hey, those two blokes really like each other. That was pretty clever. That was funny. I chuckled too. So look look for humor in your life as well. You think I can play this yeah, one? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. The, uh, this won an Emmy Award, uh, a National Emmy Award, and it was talk about, again, a stroke of luck. We were in the middle of the Olympics in Barcelona in 92. And I didn't. I don't know, I still don't know anything about Greco-Roman wrestling. Maybe some of you do. But it was automatic. If you needed a story, an emotional story at the Olympics, if you went to wrestling, uh, it didn't matter what kind of wrestling it was. These were the athletes that really gave you the, the gutsy stuff. You know, they, they weren't going to go out and make a million dollars as a professional. They were going to go back to uh, lacrosse state as the wrestling coach or back to the army where they coach wrestling. They, this was their moment. They were Olympians competing, and, and, and their feeling for this success as an Olympian, uh, certainly a leapfrog over uh, those the big stars. So we're, we're, it was one of those days that we completed one night, and the producer and director from Greco-Roman Wrestling said, we didn't even get on the air tonight. I mean, our stuff, you know, they were too busy, Greco-Roman Wrestling, and we had an American wrestling, didn't make it. But I think, knowing what you're doing, Edinburgh, that you might like to see this. And what they had done, uh, for the rare time, an American wrestler going for the gold medal, Greco-Roman wrestling, I don't think we'd ever won a gold medal. And they decided to mic his wife, who was in the audience, not knowing that their five-year-old daughter was sitting on the mother's lap, and they had a camera isolated on the mother, and of course the, the daughter as well, at the same time they were shooting the actual final. So they gave that to me. Yeah. It was like somebody gave me a million dollars. Wow, this is still on my lap. So this was uh, the piece that resulted from that. A later. And the Greco-Roman grappling of 220 pounders provided another moment to remember. One that a six and a half year old girl who cheered for her daddy with all her might will never forget. Dennis Kozlowski, a 32-year-old chiropractor from the Minneapolis area, the best ever U.S. Olympian in this sport, wrestling his heart out against Cuba's Hector Million, the world champion, eight years younger. Kozlowski, with a late comeback, cheered by his daughter, her fingers crossed, took Million into sudden death overtime for the gold medal. But he would eventually be worn down by his younger opponent. Million would prevail. Daddy had lost but finished his career proudly with a silver medal. I wore my heart on the sleeve, got the crowd into it, I got into it. It was just a terrific experience and I, now I can hold my head up, I'm really, really happy. His daughter, fingers still crossed, had trouble coping. At her age, daddies aren't supposed to lose. <laughs> How uh, great music is there, and nice shot of her. I mean, that was such a memorable shot. That's fine, thank you. Uh, that was just a taste of the piece, and they uh, edited that down. But that's just, again, good luck, something falls into the lap. And, uh, and that's where I came home, and I got uh, some of the uh, writers saying, oh, that Edinburgh is so savvy with the other one wants us to cry. <laughs> <laughs> that would be one pile of material. But the letters that came from the fans that watched it say, I sat with my daughter. We sat together and we hugged each other because you made us feel something very important in how a young girl does care about that. Any gold medals in the US. That didn't just that. Wow, that was Barcelona four years later. 
uh, where in uh, Atlanta, excuse me, that was, this is 92 Barcelona. <coughs> I think that was probably uh, in, was it in Korea. It might have been Korea in '98, yeah. because in Barcelona, the next year he, he made the Olympic team again. Miroslavski did, and uh, my wife and family were with us. And it was so unbearably hot in Barcelona. They went to Mallorca and took out for a long weekend. And I ran into Koslowski to finish the competition, and he had to stay in the Olympic Village. And his wife was staying 25 miles outside of Barcelona. They barely saw each other. I said, you know, we've got two rooms. My wife and kids are gone. Why don't you tell your wife to come in, and you can stay in the room next door? So they had a couple of nights in this nice hotel to be able to celebrate their uh, Olympic experience and, and be with each other. So that was, they gave me one of the most uh, yeah. emotional pieces that uh, we were able to uh, work with in the Olympics, and it's nice to be able to pay them back a little bit. Yes, a powerful story you can share with us about the intersection between faith and competition. Well, you know, it's, you know, sports uh, has more than its fill of spiritual moments, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it comes from a different way from different people. Uh, you know, belief in a higher being, belief in yourself, uh, belief in teammates. Uh, I mean, the spirit, the intended spirit of the Olympics is very good. Uh, and some feel that more than others. It's, uh, I think it, that is such an individual thing that it's very difficult for me as a sportscaster to get involved in it because it's, uh, it's simple but also very complicated. Isn't it? You ever see people sacrifice perhaps something that they work very hard for when they see somebody else? And I don't know that I've seen it in the Olympics necessarily, but it's for you. Well, you know, my son and I were talking last night about Sandy Koufax, young uh, Kapoor, did not pitch in the World Series. You know, his right. turn came up against the Minnesota Twins, and he said, I'm not, I'm not going to pitch today if I'm right for them. Uh, pitched against the Twins. You might think, son, is it really? Yeah. That does happen to people that have such strong beliefs that that uh, priority uh, is number one. Yes, Coach? Uh, your personal philosophy always comes into play with the things you did. When I went to your McGuire play, and I'm paraphrasing now, one of the things that was really intriguing to me was your uh, quote from Al saying, Dicky, what's best, yes or no? And that kind of always was a little mystery, and I wondered how you played that out. Why okay. so important? Uh, I wrote a one-man, one-act play of Al McGuire, who was the basketball coach at Marquette. He retired at 48. His last team was not his best team. He had teams that were much better. But it was just everything fell. Right, he had announced his retirement in the middle of the season. It was a lame duck coach, and he winds up winning the national basketball championship, championship beat North Carolina in the finals. And then he joined Billy Packer and myself as the broadcast team for NBC. And then we lost the rights to the tournament, and Billy went to CBS, and Al stayed with me. So I was with this incredible street genius for, for 15 years, and he taught me all these things that, you know, how does he see that? And it was. The fact that he had ADD and he's from New York and he had to fight through, he couldn't read and write beyond a seventh grade level and he had to work his way through the barbed wire cheating and borrowing and doing whatever he could to make, take the next step and did the, get through college and was a highly successful coach. And he, we were at a, a, a desk uh, in a hotel and the a young lady behind the desk said, we have a terrific suite for you, Mr. McGuire. The manager said, we want you to be in the best uh, accommodations we have in the hotel. It's up on the seventh floor, and uh, you're just going to let me say, oh, I don't want it on the seventh floor. Al always wanted to be on the first or second floor, and it wasn't just because he was afraid of fire. He wanted to know <laughs> that he could escape. That's another whole story. He was a rascal. Uh, so <laughs> he, she's, uh, he said, put me on the first or second floor. And uh, she said, but. I've been told this beautiful room up there is waiting for you. What, you know, please, young lady, give me a room on the first and second floor. And, and he finally turned to her and she said, well, the manager's not here. And he told me what to do. I'll have to, he won't be here for, for another half hour. He says, here, uh, young lady, no is a good answer. You know, yes is the best answer. And the worst answer is maybe. 
He said, a lot of people think no is a bad answer. No is a good answer. You can't always get yes, and doesn't it save us all a lot of time if you get a direct no? Now you can go on about your business and find the yes. But a maybe puts it off. Maybe, uh, well, wait till your father comes home, or yeah, maybe let us think about whether or not we want you to go uh, off for the next weekend. And then if, whether it's in business or family or neighborhood, maybe is a terrible word. But yes is the best, obviously, but as Al said, no is a good answer. And uh, that can help you out of some situation and certainly save a lot of time. But one of the things that happened with some of the emotional stories, like the one of the wrestler, uh, I felt that maybe we're getting, there's so many stories of that sort at the Olympics, let's, let's uh, balance it by going to some humor. <coughs> so we did this piece which uh, it was kind of a stretch, but we decided to give a gold, silver, and bronze medal to the best screamers in the Olympics. You know, like the athletes, you know, you use the tennis players running and squealing and screeching or whatever you want to call Sheriff Bova's approach. Uh, uh, football players use sound as they make the block or tackle. That there's something about what happens within us by uh, expressing ourselves with a yell or a scream. So we went through uh, all the venues and we decided we're going to give our own gold medals, our own medals, to the best streamers in the Olympic Games. So this was the problem. <laughs> And here is Mr. Enberg. Now, it's an axiom in television that the pictures tell a story, but not always. Wow, this has taken a lot of serious study. <laughs> this is a result, these moments, of man moving weight in the Olympics, as best as I can discern. In those events requiring heavy weight throws or lifts, the more you scream, the more you're likely to produce. So, without further delay, here are the first annual Olympic Screamer Awards. The bronze to discus, a small group fortified by two female competitors, the solid vocal consistency <coughs> impressive in this group. <coughs> but tying discus for the screaming bronze shot put. Judges noted good variety here, short and long power screams. Just silver screamers to the weightlifters, and they could have won the gold except for too much clean, not enough jerk.
their approval. And that's what the Olympics are all about. <laughs> Igor from Kiev, he started... So, uh, you, you find the story wherever it might be, you, you have a little thought that uh, often light comes to you, and it sports uh, some of the most surprisingly good pieces of work are those not planned. We couldn't plan that, it just, they gave it to us. So, we've got 10 minutes, no other questions? Can I ask you one? You've probably yes. heard a million times. What is one of the highlights, one of the most memorable moments for you that you covered? My most memorable moments? That you covered. Uh, well, the, it's not an uh, Al Michaels, uh, if you believe in miracles moment, that in 1980, the Olympic came to hockey game. But the most important, uh, historically, game that I had the privilege to call was in 1968. UCLA played Houston. UCLA was the defending basketball champions, and Houston was undefeated number two in the nation. They played in the Astrodome, and, and Houston was the largest crowd ever to see a game, 52,000. It was the first time ever that a regular season game, pro or, uh, you can compare it to today, we get 30 games a night, but pro or college had never been televised in prime time on a weeknight. And uh, then it was a great game, and uh, Houston won by two. And they had UCLA one, which they normally did in those days. It wouldn't have been that uh, significant, but it became the game. And from there, I think it was really uh, it catapulted the interest in college basketball and television uh, into the atmosphere. And then I did the '79 game. UCLA played. Or excuse me. Uh, Indiana State played. Michigan State. That was the Larry Bird, uh, Magic Johnson <coughs> game. And, and that was credited for being the big game. And I did the move. That was the one that. Would, uh, put on the extra rocket and send it even higher, but it was 68 UCLA, uh, Houston. But that being said, the best, the most delicious assignment that uh, an announcer can get is calling a baseball no hitter. There's no drama like it. I mean, you can have a long drive in football, and you can have uh, a basketball <coughs> run, a ten, ten run, uh, tennis, golf, whatever. But in baseball, when you look up at the scoreboard, top of the seventh inning, and there are nothing but zeros up there, and you now can start getting a bit serious about this could happen, could be a no-hitter, and now every out, every subtle movement is important. And if you're fortunate, you're in the eighth inning, and there's still a no-hitter alive, and you're working that up and building that drama, and now we, the dugout, what's happening in the dugout there? Look at the shortstop, shading a little bit to the left here. What's he going to throw him here? And there's a pop fly, now there's two away. Now the crowd is in, but now you're in the ninth inning. And uh, this last no-hitter that we called, unfortunately, was uh, the Giants and Lensico. We yet, the Potters have yet to pitch a no-hitter. This is my last year, I'm hoping that it was <laughs> <the> <laughs> intersect with that first uh, no-hitter. Uh, that uh, we, after uh, setting up the scene, I don't like to use the word no-hitter, some think that's uh, really being a dinosaur, but that's the way I am. I can say they're all zeros. As you can see, the Padres have the only, or the Giants have the only four hits in the game. There are other ways of saying it, but I don't like to use the word no-hitter. Just That's how I was raised, and some feel it's jinxes. Anyway, we set it up in the ninth inning, and I pushed the button and said to the director, now it's your game. And we may have said in uh, the final uh, seven, eight minutes of the game, three or four words. Just let the crowd and the pictures tell the story. And, and when it's all complete, you know, oftentimes it's broken up with two outs in the ninth inning, and it, it's not what you'd hope. But when it finally materializes, it, you've seen a no-hit, no-run game. It's so incredibly uh, powerful. It's, a, it's the best uh, meal you could ever serve a broadcaster. And so I've, I've been fortunate to do nine of those. And, uh, uh, Nolan Ryan's four of Nolan Ryan's, and yeah, Lindsay come the more, uh, more lately. So, yeah, that would be the. But I, I still think that maybe this last year there's that one more that's going to be the one, that one moment that's even better than all of the rest. Time for one more? Yes. Funniest brain delay, sir? Well, we, uh, in the old days, when you uh, had a rain delay at a baseball game, uh, you were obligated to stay at the stadium and fill the time. Here, now, when we have, we're on the road and there's a rain delay, we just throw it back to San Diego and the guys in the studio take care of business and we wait for the game to be resumed. But in the old days, you, you were on and until the rain uh, cleared and they got to start <coughs> off the field, you had to find uh, something to talk about. And so I worked with Don Drysdale in those days and, 
and it, he was a terrific partner, and we could talk about history and talk about, you know, I'd ask him questions like you're asking me today, you know, just pull out anything I could from him. But as we were doing this, in about 30 minutes of rain, this was in Detroit, and uh, the cameras panned the upper deck, and there was no one there except this one elderly woman, all alone, sitting just under the uh, canopy where she was out of the rain, and we would continue other conversation, and then they go back to the shot, and there she was, she was still there, she was gonna wait it out till they played again. And finally, I said, I wanna go out there and see if she'll come in the booth. So Don took over, I went out, the outdoor seat, and said, would you mind coming over and being on Los Angeles television? And she was very accommodating, came in, she knew the Tiger history, she was a great fan. We had 20 minutes of beautiful uh, by play with this, uh, She's about a 70 year old woman. She wasn't going to give up her seat, and she was going to stay there until her Tigers won that game. <laughs> so, you never know. You know, related to that, when there, was a, there was a basketball game that they went into a stall in the very beginning, and you just started singing. Okay, we'll finish with that. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm not afraid to make a public embarrassment of myself. You have to. Yeah, sometimes that, that, that arises and you just got to go with it. So we were uh, doing UCLA games, and it was the start of the conference season. They were playing University of Oregon, not a very good team, and UCLA was the defending national champions. And I, I worked those nine years at UCLA all alone. I didn't have a color man. It was just me flying solo. And our broadcast location was in the first row of the loge. And the student body section was immediately below where our TV location was. So that night, uh, long complicated, but there wasn't a, uh, other than getting over the mid-court line, there was no clock and there was no uh, rule that said you had to initiate action. And so what happened was UCLA went into its own defense and Oregon didn't want to shoot. They weren't going to win anyway, they were behind. The Oregon player came across the timeline, stopped, put the ball on his hip, and just stood there. UCLA was back in his own defense, packed in a boat, his own defense, and nothing's happened. Here I am, all alone, no color man to talk to or anything else. And so <clears throat> I'm saying, okay, uh, 14 minutes ago in the first half, and as you can see, uh, no action up there, but look at those banners up there. UCLA won the national championship there, and they won the national championship in them. So I kill another 40, 50 seconds. And you can see, he's still out there, same guy, same ball, still on his hip. And by the way, looking ahead to the rest of the schedule, they go up to Cal Berkeley and play uh, Cal and Stanford next weekend, and then they're back home for the Washington, Washington State. I borrowed some more time there, and I finally ran out of gas. And one thing I learned as a teacher is, hey, you know, you've got to be honest with your students. And if you don't know, you don't know. You don't punish them because you don't know the answer. So it was a rainy night in Los Angeles, and uh, you're all too young, but it's a it's a good movie to rent. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, the name of the movie. Robert Redford and Paul Newman. And there's a great song in that. Uh, Raindrops keep falling on your head. It's written by Brent Backrack. So I finally said, you know, I got to be honest with you. Ten minutes to go. No advanced scoring, and I'm not even thinking about the game. I'm saying this live on the air. I'm not thinking about the game. I'm, this song is going, it's been playing all week long, maybe it's because it's raining, this raindrops keep falling on your head. And then I pause, pause, pause. Then I started to hum it. And uh, so, the, so the next night, I came, the next night they had another game, there were at least 10 UCLA students waiting at the broadcast location to give me the lyrics of raindrops keep falling on your head. So that night, the game was very close. <coughs> And UCLA, UCLA uncharacteristically won on a basket with 10 seconds left. And I looked at the lyrics, and now it's 1 o'clock in the morning because it was a tape delay. And I said, you know, for you music lovers, uh, you heard me humming last night, and now you, the students have given me the lyrics. And you look at the lyrics, and they really are appropriate to how the opponents of UCLA must feel. Raindrops keep falling on your head, and just like the guy whose feet are too big for his bed, Nothing seems to fit. Those raindrops keep falling. Those winds keep falling for UCLA. <coughs> By the way, if and when UCLA wins the championship of the conference, I'll sing those at center court. Good night, everyone. I thought it was innocent. It was 1, 1 in the morning. Nobody really well. Uh, the UCLA band worked out, the pep band worked out their own rendition of raindrops keep falling. <laughs> so whenever UCLA got way ahead in the second half, they'd strike up raindrops, 
And the kids would find me, you'll sing, you'll sing, you'll sing. <laughs> and of course, that, that moment came. I went out to center court, and uh, I thought if I had delayed, you know, how the news people, they shuffle their papers and everything like they're doing business here, but they're just doing something until they go to commercial. And I, I, I delayed all I could with my papers, didn't pack up my stuff. No one left. I sang in public. 12,000 people were there to witness. So when I got down there, sang, and I always thought I could sing pretty well, but uh, I never quite got on key, I guess. And, uh, and, but a beautiful moment happened. As I started to sing, it was this celebration of what had happened on television between myself, UCLA, and the student body. I mean, they were, they were digging this old guy. And uh, it was another rainy night. And as I started to sing, the student body had brought umbrellas, of course, rainy. They opened their umbrellas. And so here I am looking into the sea of umbrellas. They kind of said, wow. I mean, we really connected. That was a nice night. Final punchline to it all. Two weeks later, I got a letter with UCLA stationery. So open it. Said, uh, you're Dr. Enberg. Uh, I'm Dr. McKenzie here at the School of Music at UCLA. I'm a big basketball fan. I watch all the games. And I know you're a former professor. And if you're ever uh, near the music department on the Westwood campus, would you be kind enough to stop by, just for academic purposes, stop by my office. I've been studying music for over 35 years. And I want you to explain two notes I've never heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be on, uh, on key tonight. <laughs> All right. Would you thank, thank you again for